Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple of data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us this time in Colombia. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Kasia Hanye. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, not, and again, I should specify not the not the university, but the country of Colombia. In any case, always good to be talking with you, Adam. So, in the second half of the show, maybe you've wondered why we haven't yet talked about Queen Elizabeth. Um, well, we will. Uh, and generally, we'll be talking about the British monarchy and the economics behind it. But first, we're going to do something that's also from the news, and the data point there is thirty-three as in 33%, which is the degree by which the Ukrainian economy is expected to contract this year. That's according to the Ukrainian government's own estimates. The Kyiv School of Economics says the war has cost Ukraine over $113.5 billion in damage. Major industries like agriculture and steel production have sustained massive losses as getting exports out of the country remains complex. And of course, the news right now about Ukraine is, is focused on the military campaign in the east. You know, all that vast progress that Ukraine has made in recapturing territory that had been occupied by Russia since the start of the war. But we wanted to see how all that relates to the economic situation across the country. That's obviously a less cheery story, but... We figured it's one that's going to inform whatever counts as victory ultimately in this war. So, yeah, to get right into it, Adam, Ukraine's military, again, is making all this progress in its counteroffensive in the east. But at the same time, as I sort of suggest, the Ukrainian economy as a whole is in pretty dire condition. So, so could this economic situation have an immediate effect on the military counteroffensive that's underway? Or are these kind of two situations just operating on very separate, different clocks? I think a couple of weeks ago, we would have said that the clocks of the economy and the battlefields in Ukraine was running on the same sort of timeline. But that was when we thought the war was had moved into an attritional phase, largely dominated by artillery. And the Ukrainian offensive of the last couple of weeks has moved at such speed that it's really changed the dynamic of the war, you know, almost on a daily basis. Um, and its momentum right now is such that nothing happening on the economic front will immediately impact this particular offensive. The timeline of the military events is days and weeks, and the timeline of the economic problems we're going to be talking about is really over a period of months. The question, therefore, really is how long the Ukrainians can maintain the military initiative and the military momentum. Do they have another offensive they're potentially planning? Some people think they've got a third force ready for a strike. Um, they must be careful, crucially, not to outrun their, their resources and their ability to sustain this uh, offensive. But assuming Russia clings on to the ropes and makes it through to the winter, um, then the economic factors will really come into play. And I think that's the point. And once they do, and this is also another vital uh, element of the answer, is once they do, the economic forces themselves have quite an elastic time dynamic, if you like. They can grind over months and indeed even years. But were Ukraine, were Kyiv to reach the critical point of no return on financial stress, then economic events, as we know from 2008 or 2020, can begin to move at the pace of Blitzkrieg, at the pace of a very fast moving war. And it's very crucial, in a sense, not to find yourself in the situation where the economic problems have to be addressed on a daily and weekly basis. And that's what we see Kyiv doing. So over the summer, for instance, as pressure built up against Ukraine's currency, they devalued by 25% to avoid finding themselves in a position of defending the indefensible, uh, which was an excessively overvalued currency peg. The problem, of course, is that Ukraine is being forced to do this as Russia is, in fact, dealing with an overvalued ruble and the value of the ruble rising. So that gives you an idea, really, of how unbalanced the economic uh, struggle has become. Yeah, so I, I suppose when you're facing a 33% contraction, that you're going to have pretty big holes in your in your economy. And it seems like the only way to kind of fill those shortfalls is going to be through some kind of economic aid from abroad. And that got me wondering, why wouldn't that aid be forthcoming from the same countries that are supporting the military Effort. I mean, we've seen all of these countries across the West saying that Ukraine's victory is 
a national interest for themselves, you know, and they're, they're really making an effort to support the Ukrainian military. So isn't that a signal that they're going to ultimately step up to help the Ukrainian economy? I mean, isn't there basically some moral hazard in offering that level of, of military assistance? Doesn't that imply serving as an economic backstop too? Yeah, well, maybe not moral hazard or something more like sunk costs or something like that. If you've put that money into the military effort, why would you not back it up? And that's certainly what the Ukrainians are going to be hoping and thinking and arguing. But I think the crucial thing is not to be excessively rationalist here and to think about what it is that enables support to be offered from the outside, what sorts of support are going to be easier to sustain. And the US, I think, broadly speaking, has been fairly consistent in being um, moving rapidly to provide both military and general financial support. The questions here are really about the EU. And in the EU's case, you would think that the logic was even more cast iron in the sense that not only has the EU committed itself like the US to ensuring that Ukraine is not defeated, and has begun to make some payments, but the EU is also essentially embarked on the trajectory which makes Ukraine a EU member at some point in the future. So you would really think that the urgency was there, but it's precisely the European case that makes us one worry because um, earlier in the year, the Commission and the EU pledged 10 plus billion euros in what they call macro financial assistance, so various types of financial support. But by early August, only 2.2 billion of that had been dispersed. And it's that delay, that gap that really, I think, makes people worry. It's ju- it's literally the case that the EU took itself on summer holiday, um, gave it a few more weeks to figure out how on earth it was going to pay this money down. And in the middle of a war, they thought, oh, well, you know, our, our schedule does not permit any meetings in August. Um, as the Ukraine was, you know, fighting for its life. It seems now that, that the Europeans have gotten the message and are speeding up the disbursement of this money. And then the question really is, you know, you surely are not kidding yourselves that this is going to be enough because even just to manage its current outgoings, Kyiv thinks it needs $17 billion by the end of the year. So three to $4 billion per month to avoid immediate massive financial stress. And we're a little ways away from that kind of commitment at this point. So, and there's no no money so far on the board for next year. And by any reasonable estimation, Ukraine's needs for support is going to go on not for you know this year or next year, but over a decade or more. And the lack of concrete planning and commitments on that kind of time horizon is quite troubling, I think. And that needs to be, apart from raising the bar, the other thing we need to be doing is clearly thinking over a longer time horizon. We also need to be thinking about the terms on which this is done, because as Ukraine takes this money, much of it in the form of loans, not all, some of it in the form of grants, it of course also ends up in the position of a debtor, which is the position it was in before this crisis broke out. And that was a relationship fraught with dynamics of you know mutual hostility, huge pressure being exerted on Ukraine. So it's not just the amount of money and the time horizon, but also the terms of this, which need to be worked out. Well, first of all, that, that just sounds like a parody of kind of European officialdom to cite the, the month of August during a war. It's just, it's impossible for us to, to, to meet any... Yep. Like we're no, just, just on it's it's august obviously i know you're at war but you know uh, you're gonna have to wait till we're we're back from holiday but i guess just to follow up briefly here i mean like is it even conceivable that ukraine could win the war and kind of like lose this economic situation at home yeah i think that's extremely well put right that that's exactly the challenge and we do have to remind ourselves that despite the incredible performance of Ukraine on the battlefield, which has taken practically everyone by surprise, I think, on if one's honest, prior to the war, Ukraine was anything but an economic success story. And now again, there were questions about how far the numbers that everyone cited, including myself, as to Ukrainian GDP were clearly misleading and were not capturing some of the reality on the ground. But if it's true that Ukraine's GDP estimates are wildly off because there's a huge informal sector that's not captured by the data, that's a problem, right? Because that points to the fact that governance isn't there, taxes aren't being paid. So there's a vast effort to be made. And before this crisis, the EU was convinced that you know Ukraine over the foreseeable future would never be a viable candidate for accession. And now the war has changed that thinking completely. So when we come back to the reality, I fear A, that things will get very complicated and difficult at a technical level. And I also think they're going to get very contentious because the kind of demands that the EU is likely to make are going to be pretty tough and going to force 
politicians in Kyiv into very difficult choices. And when that ordinary politics, if you like, of who gets what from whom resume, the extraordinary unity and solidarity that we've seen um, since the beginning of the Russian invasion, that is going to evaporate quite quickly. I fear. Yeah, I was wondering actually already how Ukraine is making ends meet under these conditions. I mean, I imagine there's some kind of austerity campaign underway. And I'm curious, yeah, what has that austerity campaign consisted of exactly? What are they cutting, spending on to get by right now? It's important for Beatable to understand this, actually, because this lack of support, the slow pace of support from the outside means that Ukraine is right now already the, the Zelensky's government that everyone you know is celebrating and cheering on for obvious reasons is already being forced to make incredibly tough choices about its priorities because the money is not there. And so in principle, everything that isn't essential to the war effort is up for the chop. Um, the thing that has gone down most dramatically is any kind of investment expenditure at a time when the government wants to be talking about reconstruction, all that is being put off for obvious reasons. But broadly speaking, their efforts to reduce public expenditure are not working in the way they intend, because overall, the demands of the war are so gigantic, and the damage being done to Ukraine's society is so severe. I mean, one third of the population is now displaced. Um, Ukraine was not, it was not an economic success story before the war, but it was not a country characterized by abject poverty either. It has a very elaborate welfare state, one of the most elaborate of the post-Soviet space. And today, over 20% of the population are estimated to be living on less than $4 a day, which is one of the global poverty standards. And that number could rise to truly horrible levels over the winter of unless aid is forthcoming could be looking at 30 to 40% poverty and really dire poverty we're talking about. So that means the government spending cannot really be cut. I mean, it's never enough to actually deal with the hardship, but they're caught between a rock and a hard place. And as the deficit builds up, because they are desperately trying to find resources to cover both the war expenditure and these huge new demands, which are coming as a result of the dislocation caused by the war, as the deficit builds up, then the question of the funding becomes more and more acute. How do you think Ukraine's economic officials would sort of think of themselves at, at this time of kind of all out war? Do they think of themselves as subordinate to military officials? Is their focus probably on how to finance the war effort that the Ukrainian military says is necessary right now? Or is it more likely that Ukraine's po economic policymakers are maybe even arguing for a reduction in the war effort for the sake of economic goals? This is a crucial question and one that has not been explored enough um, because, again, Ukraine's political economy, its political system was not known for its unity of purpose and action before this crisis broke out, on the contrary, and quietly, and I think somewhat off the radar and, and below the headlines, over the summer already there have been divisions that have emerged between Zelensky's government and the independent central bank along precisely the lines that you would expect in a situation of extreme stress like this. Of course, no one is going to be advocating reducing the war effort as such, right? No, no patriotic Ukrainian with an eye to the existential struggle that Ukraine is fighting right now is going to advocate a less war effort. The question is always going to be strategic. In other words, how best to conduct the war effort, right? And that depends on whether you think that the absolute priority is some huge immediate push by all means necessary, whatever it takes, however disequilibrating this is, however much it throws the economy off balance, or whether you take the view that the long run is crucial for Ukraine's survival and also its ability to win the peace that comes afterwards. And so in the name of that vision of you know, a bigger victory, if you like, you advocate for a more conservative policy now. And I think those are the terms on which this argument is being had out. And the urgency of these questions will become more and more uh, serious over the winter because you know, we're, so far this has been a spring and a summer war. But we're talking about Ukraine here. Like, so come the fall, the, the temperature is going to fall precipitously. We'll go through the ghastly mud period first, then we'll come out the other side and it will be freezing cold. And we're talking about a third of the population displaced, you know, entire towns and cities ruined uh, by the war. And extremely serious choices are going to have to be made about really matters of survival. And that's why it's so vital for external aid to back up this war effort, because otherwise the choices are incredibly painful. You know, you've, you're going to have to tax or cut spending to see your way through or print money, which then is what, as it were, upsets the central bank so much because effectively they're on the hook as the last resort of 
sovereign monetary financing. Yeah, I guess finally, I was wondering about a specific means of financing a war. I, you know, whenever I've you read U.S. history uh, when it came to 20th century wars, the subject of war bonds always came up, you know, as a way of financing a major war effort like this. So why wouldn't Ukraine be trying to do that? Or are they already in generally, has that been a popular instrument elsewhere in the world recently to, to finance wars? Kiev is definitely trying to raise funds by issuing bonds, of course, as you say, it's the standard way to go. But the problem is that people aren't buying them, right? Because to sell bonds, you, you need to offer attractive terms underpinned by confidence. And that's precisely what's missing. And this is, as it were, why the story about the economy is such an important foil against which to read the for, you know, for very good reasons, excited, um, uh, celebratory uh, reporting on the, the battlefront. Because if you look behind the scenes, if you look at the question of how Kiev is going to finance itself, what you see there, broadly speaking, is a vote of no confidence in the financial management of the war. And that's not because Ukraine's government is doing anything wrong in a tough situation. It's doing what it can. But simply investors ask themselves, why should I you know, throw good money into what is essentially looking like an inflationary mill that is going to consume the money that's invested. Um, because, you know, what are your options? You, you should be able to tax. You, you can't tax during this war. The government expenditure is surging. Um, you could borrow from abroad, but that will be debt in a foreign currency. And that will have club priority as well over repayment, most likely, if you get money from the IMF that has absolute priority over all other debt. So if you're lending to the Ukrainian government in Ukrainian currency, you are putting yourself in harm's way. Um, and one way of, as it were, measuring, one way of gauging whether or not the stability of the home front has been secured over a short to medium term time horizon would be precisely if the um, domestic bond market um, in Ukrainian currency revives. When that happens, when they are actually able to finance the war through substantial bond issuance domestically, we'll know that they've reached a safe land. Got it. Okay. Well, we do need to leave it there, but we will be back to talk about the British monarchy in just a second. Hi, and welcome back. The next data point is 86.3, as in 86.3 million pounds. That is the size of the sovereign grant, that's what it's called, that the British royal family received for the years 2021 and 2022, and that's for its official and household expenses. Yeah, and of course, when it comes to the royal family, household expenses are themselves a kind of official expense. We're seeing that right now with the funeral of Queen Elizabeth. And on Monday, the 19th of September, the state funeral. The UK newspapers this morning, some are estimating a million people will do so paying their respects. We're seeing that in the way it's affected public life in Britain, the way visitors are flying in from abroad, all of that is just a reminder that, yeah, she was head of state of the United Kingdom. So we thought we'd look at the economics of how this peculiar part of the British state works exactly. So, Adam, curious just to start out by asking whether the British royal family's wealth, is it personal or is it institutional? Are they wealthy by virtue of being monarchs and thus having control of state assets, or are they just an independently wealthy family that happens to be the heads of state under Britain's constitutional system? Yeah, it's a really tricky question, both from the point of view of sort of constitutional history and understanding and legality, and actually also just sort of accounting how much money is involved. I mean, on one estimate, I've seen the total value, the total um, uh, assets of the so-called the firm, you know, <laughs> rather significantly, this is the name that they the Windsors actually apply to themselves since the the big crisis of the 1930s. I mean, on one estimate, you know, their 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 assets are about 28 billion dollars, and so we're talking about serious amounts of money. Um, the vast majority of that are the so-called crown lands. There's also the duchies of Lancaster and Cornwall, and then top of that, and this is the most sort of closely guarded secret element of this, is is exactly how wealthy they are as individuals. So the land of the duchies and the crown lands are, are public wealth of the royal house. And then, then you know, the queen herself was an incredibly wealthy woman. By some estimates, you know, $500 million would be not far off. That includes two palaces, Sandringham and Balmoral, and a, 
a stamp collection valued at $100 million, which means, which makes me think the $500 million estimate may be on the low side. But if we go back to the kind of more tough um, issues of the Britain's constitutional development, it's, a, it's an important and interesting story because it really does get to the heart of the separation of the personal and the public. Because the English monarchs, like most monarchs in most places, basically owned land they owned the country and they, they they owned it by the right of seizure essentially following the norman conquest in 1066 the last great seizure of property by the crown in britain was the taking of the monasteries by henry the eighth and after the reformation in the 1500s in 1760s, is really the moment where the British constitution and its modern form with regard to this element really emerges because at that point the the royal house hands off the entire all its possessions the crown lands to the state machine, to the UK Treasury, essentially. All of the income from the Crown lands refer, uh, comes to the Treasury. And the civil service bill, the entire bill for running government, is also then taken onto the account of the Treasury and Parliament. And the Royal House, from that moment onwards, receives the so-called civil list, which is a grant by Parliament to fund the, the monarchy. And that system continued for 250 years, all the way down to 2011, as recently as that, when a Tory government in an age of austerity decided that having parliaments voting the civil list was something of an embarrassment. And so instead they did a kind of almost like public-private kind of partnership in which the Treasury as the public branch um, agrees to share the revenue from the royal lands. These are these giant landholding of about $20 billion worth of land across Britain, property which is leased out, rented out in various ways and developed. And that revenue is split 15 to 85% in favor of the Treasury, 85%, the Royal Household receive 15%. And because they've been in the business of doing this major refurb of Buckingham Palace to the tune of several hundred million dollars, the split recently has been 25%, 75%. But that's how the general funding model works. Got it. I mean, it does seem to me that there are still sort of vestiges of this kind of older monarchical rights that are still around in Britain and around the royal family that are, yeah, in strange tension with the kind of modern sense of property rights. I mean, so specifically now when it comes to King Charles, he now by virtue of being the monarch, if I understand correctly, owns the Duchy of Lancaster. And this is pieces of land and other assets. And I'm just curious if does that mean he owns it in a modern legal sense? I mean, does he now come into possession of these deeds in a way? Could he sell the Duchy of Lancaster now if he wanted to? And yeah, this extends to other sort of strange kinds of uh, aspects of royal ownership I've come across. Britain's swans, for example, apparently are owned by the monarch, or there is a classification of royal fish, whales, dolphins, sturgeon that are all owned by the monarch. So yeah, how does this stand in relationship to kind of our our modern sense of ownership and what that means? Yeah, so just to avoid confusion amongst our dear listeners, there are two duchies that matter here. There's the Duchy of Cornwall, which is what Charles was until he became king. And that he turned that into a you know a kind of um, you know environmentally and socially conscious investment colossus that was worth about one point three billion dollars. At the moment, he handed it off to his son William, who's obviously his now heir apparent. And then the other one is the Duchy of Lancaster. Now you don't, I don't think it's quite right to say you own hmm. as you inherit the title of King of England or Queen of England, you become Duke or Duchess of Lancaster. It goes hand in hand. And as such, in the right of the crown, in other words, by virtue of being the person who inhabits that role, you then, you could say, own this land. But really what you're entitled to is the flow of revenue from it. So you can't sell it. It's non, it's inalienable. So you, in your role as like king, cannot decide, well, henceforth, my successors as kings and queens will not have this land. It stays intact. All you can do with it is, is, is lease it out or rent it or develop it in other ways. You can't sell it. The swans and all that, yeah, that's kind of crazy. Um, I mean, it's not as crazy as it sounds. Like, why swans? Well, the answer is, of course, that swans once upon a time were the piece de resistance in any really serious banquet, right? So if you're going to have a really big banquet, you served a swan, um, cooked, like to eat. And uh, they were rare. And so the kings being the kings said, all swans in the country belong to us. Um, So when we say the monarchs of 
the United Kingdom own all of the swans, of which by now there are 32,000, so no longer as rare, and also, of course, protected, so we don't eat them. But in any case, the monarchs own them in the sense that no one else owns them. Mm. Right? So that's, I think, the, the crucial idea here. I think it's interesting because, yeah, this is ownership, but it's not in the sense of it being a commodity. I mean, it's sort of no. claiming a right to things. You're not free to do with it what you want. I mean, there's no no one's under the impression that King Charles now can sell off all of the, 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 the swans. swans. Yeah. No, no, you can't collateralize the swans for the. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give them any ideas. Um, but um, uh, this does raise the question also, though, of you know, obviously there is a Republican movement in Britain that would like to abolish the monarchy, and this got me wondering about how one would even go about doing that, given the system we've just described. I mean, what parts of these economic holdings even belong to the British state properly understood rather than the title of the monarchy itself that is independent of it? I mean, what would happen if Britain really tried to pursue a Republican uh, option at all? I mean, I think um, it would be quite simple to do on the basis of you know, the, the structure of the division between the personal private property of the royals on the one hand, which is really outside the limelight. And he's modest, you know, they're not even billionaires. They're not really proper oligarchs. They're just kind of rich people. They don't have as much wealth as your average hedge fund billionaire in the United States, let alone a, a Bezos or somebody like that. Where their wealth is really located is these crowned land portfolios, uh, Duchy of Lancaster and Cornwall. And those are already under professional management and subject to public audit. So you'd, literally all you'd need to do would be retitle them and um, transfer the revenue flow away from the royal house, and that would be it. And then you would just require, you know, the the royal household to pay taxes like everyone else. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, that. Yeah. I, it got me wondering what is exactly is the relationship of a sovereign <laughs> like King Charles to taxes. I mean, is he required to pay taxes on his income, the way that normal British citizens do? You know, his subjects. <laughs> How about? Just the inheritance taxes on whatever he, he inherited from Queen Elizabeth. Did he have to, to pay taxes on that? They're not required to pay income tax, but under a political arrangement uh, reached with by the Queen with the governments of the 1990s, they volunteered to pay tax, at least on a substantial fraction of their income. So the income from the Duchy of Lancaster, the core income of the household, is, is taxed. What they don't do, and under quite explicit and sort of legal entitlement, is they do not pay inheritance tax. For some reason, this was you know a bugbear of the John Major government in the 1990s, uh, the conservative government that came after Margaret Thatcher, the one that never, one, no one ever remembers, it was quite consequential in various ways. And one of the things it did was to amend the royal inheritance law. And they apparently got worried about the fact that the royals might... You know, there might be a short sequence in which the Queen would die, then Charles would inherit, then he would die. And if you apply the inheritance taxation in short succession, you could end up essentially stripping almost all of the assets. Because in Britain, you know, over £325,000, which is $400,000, give or take, you pay 40% inheritance tax. So you could end up with a, you know, a very rapid, as it were, um, tax clawback of, of assets. And for some reason, they decided they really wanted to prevent this. So... Um, you know, uh, really, on on the death of the monarch, no inheritance tax, no inheritance tax is due. And um, this wasn't when the queen mother died in two thousand and two. No inheritance tax was was clawed back, and in this case as well, uh, nothing will be due. But um, you know, more seriously, you just have to ask yourself the more basic question: Is and if we're talking about a pot of assets worth twenty billion dollars plus, is maintaining a this ongoing, you know, festival of pomp and ceremony and this soap opera of their private lives, really the most sensible use for that money? Or could it be spent on something else? You know, could it be, could the could, could it be kept as a perpetual thought pot by all means? Could it be used for educational purposes? Or could it in fact be sold and used to fund, for instance, heat pumps for a large part of the British population to deal with, you know, the energy transition and the climate crisis? It's not a vast amount of money. You couldn't, transform Britain with it. But um, you could certainly do something more useful than than generating this show. But that's a very utilitarian kind of crass way of looking at this. I, I mean, I admit I find it also bizarre. I, I, I really try to understand what the death of the Queen means. And I, try, I find it hard to understand. Blank. And I don't, yes, I, it's a blank. Yeah, I, There's all these conversations about why I can't mourn and, you know, 
uh, former and, colonial subjects, like having to explain why they can't mourn and just simply <laughs> pointing out the racism of the British <laughs> Empire. It's like, I think folks, like, just so, you know, you, you well, just don't feel the pressure. Like, you know, but and, like, yet, and yet people are really, mourning. People less, are, I mean, but, that, but that's the flip side, Adam. Though, is, yeah. People are lining up, though. I mean, that's the yeah. thing. People are lining yeah. I read miles four miles. miles they're going to be lining up to, to, to see the casket. I'm, I'm an expat for a reason. And, and uh, <laughs> there so, we go. So the spectacle. I do not find the exactly. Don't look for Adam out on the line. It sounds like, um, uh, I, I yeah. Just to finish off the conversation, I'm just curious whether we have any sense of what the monarch's views on economic policy are. I mean, just in terms of class analysis, would royals typically be in alliance with the capitalist class? It seems like they may not be in terms of just yeah the, where they are in, in class terms. I mean, would they be supporting? kind of the neoliberal reforms that we saw in Britain, in the US and elsewhere? This is a really interesting question. And you know, one reason why even a absolutely intemperate Republican like myself actually very much enjoyed watching The Crown, the TV series, is that it did such a good job of you know, producing a narrative of the relationship of the monarchy to British class relations, which is quite complex. You know, because at one hand, you know, these are dynamical monarchists. They actually believe in the operations. And the most dramatic moment of this tension is it's not just, I think, a matter of speculation that the relationship between the royal family and Margaret Thatcher, you know, Diane, the wall conservative, if there ever was one, um, was very tense because Thatcher was a no-nonsense, uh, hard-driving neoliberal uh, conservative who didn't have a lot of truck for aristocracy and inherited privilege. She'd come up not hard herself, but she'd come up a long way from the daughter of a grocer who fought her way you know, through the British establishment. When Thatcher took power within the Tory party, it was known in the upper echelons of the Tory party as the Peasants' Revolt. That then plays out in, in relations both with the Queen, who was quite exercised, I think, about the impact of social inequality on the stability of her rule, and above all in Scotland, because in the late 1980s there was an upsurge in nationalist opinion. And at the time in Scotland, nationalism was associated with the Scottish vision of social democracy. And so the Queen was concerned that Thatcher's ruthless pursuit of deindustrialization was in fact jeopardizing the coherence of the monarchy. So that's one way of linking it up. And more relevantly now, perhaps Charles, as Prince Charles, from the 80s onwards, was you know a very open backer of various types of commu community redevelopment. And uh, in one famous occasion came into conflict with Thatcher over her community redevelopment, uh, inner city redevelopment kind of programs where he was trying to enlist her in various patronages that he was involved in and she was profoundly reluctant and ended up giving him a stern lecture about you know, the realities of economic policy that this indulgent aristocrat didn't really understand. So from do haut en bas, kind of noblesse oblige, these kind of ideas of you know, privilege in the interested in the maintenance of the status quo, that the the monarchy's relationship to to British society and British politics is quite is quite complicated. And their only hope, after all, of survival in the long run is to secure support on a mass basis, and that means, amongst other things, from working class people. Yeah, that's interesting that they've managed to create a class alliance in a weird way with the working classes. They don't who don't think of them as oppressors in any way. But I guess that, as you point out, also could change. Who knows? Okay, well, I do think we need to leave it there for now. Yeah, uh, to anyone in Britain who is mourning our sympathies, but I suppose we're not among the, among the mourners uh, this next week, I suppose. But uh, yeah, we will leave it there for now. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos, it is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Two's, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Two's listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TOOZE at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, 
or tweet us. That's at ones and twos pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week. <laughs>